Many faces. <laughs> you said the same? <laughs> friendly faces could be the problem. Yeah. <laughs> We're available, but are we friendly enough is the question. Are our faces okay? So, let me get this friend back here. Um, we are. There we go, John. I'll give you a headache anymore. It stays in one place. Uh, we're talking about Christ this evening. Who is Christ? Which is the next chapter of this book, if you have it, which is page. 67, but as always, we'll begin with the actual question itself. Who is Christ? The Savior. Savior. Now, I'll spell it the American way. <laughs> and it was just there was a song on Sunday morning that had the English spelling for the word Savior. Don't do that just for me. <laughs> of course they did. Of course they did. Of course they did. Sorry, the Messiah. The Alpha and Omega. Here, Someone say, "Am I here?" What do you say now? The promised one. Holy God. Yep. Holy man. Yeah. Holy yeah. man. Yeah. God in the flesh. Mm hmm. God in the flesh. Logos. Just tell us. The name of God. The word. Prince of Peace. Eternal. Okay. Okay. The door. The door. Second person of the Trinity. Yeah. Way of life. Yep. Yep. How about that? Way of life. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Great High Priest. Yes. Great High Priest. Father of creation. Sorry? Father of creation. He was in Jesus. I have said he created Jesus. Mediator. Him, all things about creating. Mediator. Mediator. Who's my kids in the Bible? That was a king. He was a type of Christ. A type of Christ, exactly. Yeah. Like, is a type of Christ. This is an illustration of the forward to Christ. Redeemer. Yeah, great word. Redeemer. The risen one. <laughs> We're going to have to leave it there. Um, it's great that we have so many words, terms, phrases to refer to Christ. It just shows that our understanding of Christ, at least from these words, is, is full because we, just by writing those words up on the board, represent so many aspects of who Jesus Christ is. But uh, let's read from the book and see if we can engage in a little more discussion on Two things in particular. Uh, well, one, one thing really. Um, I'll maybe start with that term, um, see if we know what that term actually means. Have you heard of the term hypostatic union? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, that's basically what we're talking about this evening, the hypostatic union, the fact that Jesus is fully God and fully man at the same time. And the term for that is hypostatic union. Um, that's basically what tonight's lesson is all about. And if you're talking theology, um, that's what it would be called, just so you know, if you ever hear that phrase, hypostatic union, it's, it's talking about Jesus being fully God and fully man, how he can be fully God and fully man at the same time. So that basically is, is the focus of all that speaking about this evening. But let me uh, read the introduction from Grudem to get us started here. In the person of Jesus, God physically entered into our world. An infinite God came to live in a finite world. The one who knew exactly how things were supposed to be came to a place where things obviously weren't. And this full stop there, and I was reading that, I thought, did he, did he not finish his sentence? And I was thinking actually about what he's saying. And it's true, isn't it? The one who knew exactly how things were supposed to be came to a place where things obviously weren't exactly how they were supposed to be. In Jesus, God, and man became one person. So that is the hypostatic union. A person unlike anyone else the world has ever seen or will ever see. Jesus Christ was and forever will be fully God and fully man in one person. And that one person changed the course of history forever. Jesus was fully and completely human. He was conceived in the womb of his mother by a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. This is made clear in Matthew 1, verse 18. So let's read that verse together. This is one of the key verses. We're going to use a little more Bible as we go forward from here. So if you have Bible with you, uh, we're reading from Bible, but I actually want you to see Bible with yourselves as well. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. The record of the birth of Jesus Christ. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the incarnation, the birth of Jesus Christ was not an ordinary birth. He was born of man and born of the Spirit, both man, human, and Spirit, God. Um, he was fully man and fully God. The birth of Jesus Christ, says Wayne Brudem, took place in this way when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. You know what betrothed means? Betrothed is basically engaged, but there's a little more than our engagement to break a betrothal when you had to divorce. So that's why Joseph, when he heard that Mary was pregnant, sought to quietly divorce her, even though they weren't married. Because to betroth, to be betrothed to someone was to be legally bound to someone, but not actually get married. So to break the relationship required a divorce. So betrothal was more than engagement, because you can break off an engagement, but you couldn't break off betrothal without a divorce. It was a deeper, greater commitment. So they betrothed to one another, Mary and Joseph, before they came together as a sexual union. She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. While many things can be said about this, one thing is clear. Jesus was born of a human mother, his ordinary human birth affirms his humanity. Nobody denies that, right? He's born of a human mother, and Mary was a regular human being, a good, faithful human being. But she was also a sinner. The Magnificat confirms that for us. My spirit rejoices in what does it say? God, my Savior. God, my Savior. She, she needed a Savior. So she was not holiness and perfection. She was a regular human being. And she needed a savior as much as anyone else. And amazingly, she gave birth to the savior. Just as we have a human body, so did Jesus. Luke chapter 2, verse 40. Luke chapter 2, verse 40. Luke 2, verse 40. The child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. He, he grew in wisdom. As he got older, he became wiser. That's what's supposed to happen to, to all of us, right? As we get older, we're supposed to be wiser. We have more experience of life. We have more knowledge and more understanding. Uh, in John 4, 6, we're told that he became weary from a journey. Uh, in Matthew 4, 2, we're told that after a fast, he was hungry. And while on the cross, he said he was 
person. Okay, so he was human, fully human, experienced all of the things that we experience as human beings, including temptation. And, and we remember the temptation of, of Jesus Christ. He rose from the dead in a physical human body that was no longer subject to weakness, disease, or death. Um, how do we know that the post-resurrection body of Jesus was different to the pre-crucifixion crucifixion body of Jesus? He wasn't recognized right away. Sorry? He wasn't recognized right away. Yeah, um, he wasn't recognized right away because they thought he was the gardener, but then he appears to the apostles. And how do they recognize him primarily, we're told? The scars. By the scars. The nail prints in his hands. But I do still think, I'm also thinking of the road to miss. You know, they didn't recognize, recognize him immediately either, but they said their hearts were burning within them. There was something about his presence that they knew was different. And he appeared to the disciples through locked doors. So I'm yes, that. okay, so that's exactly right. That's, that's what I'm thinking of. So the doors were locked and he appears to the disciples a week later in that room. Uh, Thomas wasn't present. Thomas missed out and they, the apostles say, Jesus appeared to us. And he says, unless I see what? The nail prints and touch them. I won't believe. So a week later, Jesus appears again. Thomas is present. He sees. We don't read that he had to touch. He sees, and it seems that that's enough for him then to believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. So Jesus, I think, looks like he did, but wasn't somehow immediately recognizable and was able to go through walls, but also ate. So his body was similar, but different. There's something different about the post resurrection body of Jesus Christ. He had a physical body like we did, like we do before his crucifixion, and then he has a different body after his resurrection, which is the same, going to say for us. We're going to have a resurrected body, which is going to be perfect. It's going to look just like you, Tom. We're all going to look exactly like you. I don't know how old we're going to be, I don't know what we're going to look like, I don't know how that, how that is, but we're all going to be different, and we're all going to be made perfect. Jesus himself said, uh, touch me and see. Uh, Jesus' mind was my like ours as well. He went through the learning process as a child. Luke, for example, tells us in Luke 252, he increased in wisdom. We just read that. Like a normal child, he learned how to do things such as talk, read, write, and eat. How that work? And that's that's a hard one to understand, isn't it? When Jesus is fully God and yet fully human, he went through the same process that we went through as children to learn how to speak and how to read and how to write. And yet he was fully God, you don't know all those things. Right? How does how does that work? This is hypostatic union. This is the complexity of Jesus Christ. How does one person have two natures? Mind blown. Does he have two natures? Is, I guess is the question. Human and deity. Yeah. So he's fully man, fully God. So when he's a child, was he fully man? And what happened to the deity? Set it aside, it's parts of it aside. Okay, set the deity aside. Parts of it. He parts of his deity. Sorry? He humbled himself. Yes. So he humbled himself and put the deity aside. Yes. In, in, yeah. The text that comes to mind in that regard is Philippians 2. When Jesus came and humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on the cross. So there was a, certainly a humbling that God himself would take on flesh and go through life as we do. And life is fallen life in this fallen world as we do. Um, so he set his deity to one side. So then in that case, he called upon his deity at certain times. I don't think he actually set his deity aside. I think he limited it himself. Okay. He was always, always fully God. Yeah. He was always fully man. I, I don't I don't see it being one of the other different. Okay. Right. So, uh, yeah. My problem, what I have to understand your solution, what I think is that he set his, did set his deity aside, and his power was from the Holy Spirit, just like what we have access to. Mm -hmm. Now, as believers, I think that all of his power was through the Holy Spirit, not yeah, through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. and
just really what a portion to the So uh -huh. that bill was to do the same, so it was a power of attorney and particular things. Yeah. And it wasn't it was its own deity that he okay. I understand what you're saying. I think we could do anything that God gives us the ability to do in the power of the Spirit. So, miracle, miraculous signs, if God wanted us to perform miraculous signs, we would have to do that. Yeah. Anything, but never perfection. So, we're always going to be different to Jesus in regards to perfection. And my understanding of Jesus is that he's fully God. So, whereas we would be calling on the power of the Spirit to do those things in and through us, God being Three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit was the originator of those things. We're never the originator of those things. So we can do it by the power of the Spirit in our lives, if God so desires. But Jesus being fully God, fully man, fully Father, fully Son, fully Spirit, didn't actually need to call upon the Spirit to do what he did because he was God. And yet he did depend on the Father and he did call on the Spirit. And, and so there's that complexity. Um, Jesus is fully God and perfect, which of course will never be. I think this is going to be the great joy we're going to learn and knowledge <clears throat> once we're in heaven. Mm -hmm. I think it's an incredibly challenging intellectually to try to understand because the man part is serving and living like we do with all the things that cause sin mm -hmm. and, and knowing and feeling them and you know, having those, those human feelings of getting hit or whatever, hunger, yeah. whatever it might be, mm -hmm. <clears throat> while still being God. I, 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 do, I have to say, I think it's too complex for us to understand. Yeah. I think it's going to be a great understanding that we'll come to one day. And I'm so thankful, though, that it happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. And, and uh, I think that we will never fully grasp this. I think it's something that exists again outside of our dimension. But that doesn't excuse us from studying the nature of Jesus Christ and being as aware of that as we can be. This is one of the most helpful books I've ever read on the nature of Jesus Christ. It's written by Dr. Bruce Ware. It's called The Man Christ Jesus. And I want to read a couple of uh, extracts from this book. Even he can't describe it very well, but he does it better than I do, and better than most of us might as well. Um, he's talking about uh, one thing that actually we should talk about, which is also very relevant and very important to this discussion, is the uh, kenosis. You know what that means? You heard of that word before? No. Okay, so these are two key words when it comes to talking about Jesus Christ. Kenosis, which is what we see in Philippians chapter 2, the emptying of himself. Um, there's an old hymn, isn't there? Um, and can it be that I should gain? There's a line in it which says, empty, empty himself of all but love. Yeah, it always just that jars a little bit, that line, when we say, that's a great hymn. That line comes along a little bit. Hmm. So did it cease to be God? I'm not sure that it says quite enough in that one line, empty himself of all but love. But you know he was God, always fully God. And what's interesting, he knew himself he was God. Yeah. John 8, 58. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He, he, okay, so let me read this because this is going to help us, I think, with the understanding of actually what Jesus did, who Jesus is. And, um, as one who is fully God, Christ Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. That's verse 7 of Philippians chapter 2. The word that here is translated emptied himself, echinosen, third aorist indicative means literally just this, that Christ emptied himself or poured out himself. Note, says Dr. Ware, that Paul is not saying that Christ emptied something from himself or poured something out of himself, as if in doing so he became less fully God than he was before, which as we've seen is impossible earlier in the book. Rather, he emptied himself. He poured out himself. Okay, so he poured out himself. He didn't pour out some part of himself, so he ceased to be who he was in his forms. That's why that line just like he emptied himself of all the love. It kind of says like he's he's just literally thrown everything out and all that remains is love. But that's not what happened. He emptied himself on the cross. He didn't empty some of who he was or some of who he, he didn't cease to be less God or less man. Or less any of the characteristics of God that we read of in the Bible. He was who he was. He never ceased to be anything else. 
The question then becomes just what does it mean that Christ, the one who exists in the form of God, as equal to God, pours out himself? The answer comes amazingly in three participles, particularly the first one that follows Echinosa. Christ poured himself out, taking the form of a servant. Yes, he pours out by taking. He pours out by taking. Okay, so it's the opposite, actually. He's not pouring out and ceasing to be what he was, but as he pours out, he takes something in addition upon himself. What's it? What is it that he takes upon himself? Humanity. The form of a certain humanity. So he remains as he was and is always, has always been, but takes upon himself humanity takes upon himself the form of a servant. He pours out by taking on. He empties by adding. Here there is a strange sort of math that envisions a subtraction by addition, an emptying by adding. Do you see what he's saying? He's not emptying himself of anything, but in his emptying, he's taking on. He's humbling himself, he's becoming man, not ceasing to be any less deity than he was taking on humanity, but still fully God. And so there are a couple of illustrations in this book, which every single illustration on these types of things falls down at some point, but they, I think they are at least slightly helpful. So let me, let me tell you the, the two stories that Dr. Ware uses in this book. First of all, he says, um, what this means is Christ Jesus existing and remaining fully who he, is, who he is as God accepts his divine calling to come to earth and carry out the mission assigned for him by the Father. As the eternal Son of God, who is himself the form of God, he must come in the form of a servant, that is, he must come fully as a man, and as a man he must live his life and give his life as one of us. In doing so, Christ pours himself out as he takes on, in addition to his full divine nature, a full human nature. This is crucial. It's crucial to see that in the self-emptying of the eternal son, Paul does not say that he poured out something of himself. Absolutely not. Rather, he poured out himself. All of who he is as the eternal son of the father, as the one who is the form of the father, is poured out fully. There's no subtraction. So here's the illustration. Illustration number one. He says, imagine going first of all into a new car dealership. A car dealership to buy a new car. And as you're looking around the showroom floor, a salesman approaches you and talks to you about several models on display. Your eye lands on a particularly bright and shiny car, brilliantly reflecting the sun streaming in. You ask if you can test drive this beautiful shiny car, and the salesman agrees. As you leave your test drive, you decide to drive out the country for a bit, and in doing so, you come upon some unpaved dirt roads. So it happens that this area had received torrential rains for the past several days, so these dirt roads are extremely muddy. Nonetheless, you drive this new shiny car on those muddy back roads for several miles, spinning the tires and enjoying how the car handles those slippery conditions. Returning the car to the dealership, you pull it into the lot, and drive it right back onto the showroom floor, now caked all over with mud. When the salesman sees you and his car, he comes over and exclaims, what have you done to my car? At this, you calmly reply, I haven't taken anything away from your car. I've only added to it. <laughs> and of course, the point is correct. The beautiful shine of the car is still there. Its luster and beauty have not been removed. What has happened is that something else has been added to the car that prevents these qualities from being able to shine through. The beauty of the car has not been destroyed or even demolished, but that beauty has been covered over by the mud. One might even say this, the glory of the car is every bit as much present as it was previously, but this glory could not be seen for what it is because of the covering of mud. Taking on the mud then had added something that results in it appearing less. Well, in fact, it is only more. That's good, isn't it? I, I, that, that is a good illustration of something that is very complex to understand. It hasn't ceased to be what it was when it took it from the show. Something has been taken upon that car in addition to what it was, and it appears to be less. It's not. His second illustration is equally as helpful. Imagine now. Uh, a great and glorious kingdom that's ruled by a strong and wealthy king. This king has every privilege one can imagine, and he possesses the finest of everything money can buy. He eats each day from the choicest cuisine. He wears the most elegant and exquisite of clothes. He is cared for by the highest educated and most skilled doctors in the land, and he is protected by a, an impenetrable force of royal soldiers. 
Yet one day, as the king was taken on a short journey to another portion of the royal city, he passed an area he seldom had seen before. Before him on the streets, he observed several beggars, and he could not get these poor men out of his mind. On his return to the palace, he thought to himself, I wonder what it's like to live life as a beggar. And he could not remove this question from his mind. So with a determination to find out just what such a life is like, he decided to move out of the royal palace and onto some of the impoverished streets of his city. And instead of wearing fine clothing from his wardrobe, he put on tattered, smelly clothes of a beggar. In every way he could, he acquired the day-to-day -day life and limitations of a beggar. Now, having taken on the restrictions of beggarly life, when the king was hungry, although he could have called for the royal chefs to bring him a choice meal, in order to live life as a beggar, he instead learned what it was to go hungry or beg for food. And when the king grew ill from disease, the disease surrounding him, while he could have called for a highly trained doctor to attend him, in order to live life as a beggar, he accepted being sick with little if any help from his illness. And when insulted and mistreated by mean-spirited passerbys, although he could have called for the royal guard to defend him and bring justice to bear against this cruelty, in order to live life as a beggar, he accepted with no retaliation the mistreatment and insults foisted upon him. So while all of the qualities of his kingship were retained fully by this king become beggar, the expression or manifestation of many of the rights and privileges he had as king could not be made, since he had chosen to live life as a beggar. Or again, while the king possessed all of the qualities that are his as king, in taking on the life of a beggar, many of those kingly qualities could not be expressed, while at the same time living fully and with integrity the life that a beggar lives. The point is this. The king cannot live according to all the rights and privileges he knows as king, while also living life genuinely and authentically as a beggar. Once he chooses to take on the life of a beggar, he must necessarily accept the restriction or limitation of the expression of qualities, rights, and prerogatives he had as king. Although he is king, and hence continues to possess everything that is his as king, he now is also a beggar, and he must accept the fact that many of his kingly rights and prerogatives can no longer be utilized or expressed. Although he exists fully as king and possesses fully all the qualities that are his as king, he now has given himself fully to the task of taking on life as a beggar, and in doing so, the limitations of kingly expression are necessary. Same with Jesus. He didn't cease to be God, but he humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a man and no less a servant. And I think Dr. Ware's illustrations in, in that way are helpful to help us grasp the, what Jesus always was from eternity past. He did not cease to be, but he took upon himself the nature of, of the man. Bruno talks about the fact that Jesus felt real emotions. He wept at the tomb of Lazarus. So you remember Jesus wept. He experienced true emotion. He prayed to God. Isn't it amazing to see Jesus praying to God? So he prayed to his father, depended on his father, um, maintained that relationship with his father through prayer. Before his crucifixion, he said, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. And now is my soul troubled. That's John chapter 12, verse 27. Jesus was like us in every respect, but what? He was without sin. So as we conclude, Rudum mentions a few things concerning the fact that Jesus was fully God. As we stated earlier, Jesus was conceived in the womb of his mother by a miraculous work of the Spirit. Jesus' virgin birth was a supernatural work of God. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. It confirms for us that Jesus is fully God in this verse. This is a really important verse. If you're trying to speak to someone who denies the deity of God and Jehovah's Witness, for example, um, then this is a great verse to prove that Jesus is fully God. For in Christ... All the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. Okay? In Christ, all the fullness of God lives in, in bodily form. That's the NIV. Uh, has anybody else got a different translation for that verse? Are they all saying similar things? Almost identical, identical. So in Jesus, the fullness of God exists. That's a, that's a key verse. When asked if he had seen Abraham, Jesus responded by saying, before Abraham was, I am. 
That's John chapter 8, verses 57 and 58. Those who heard him say this, what did they do? Picked up stones to stone him, because in that statement, he was claiming to be God, which did not please those who were around him. They understood Jesus was claiming to be God when he said that. Revelation chapter 22, verse 13. Revelation 22, verse 13 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, first and the last, the beginning and the end. So he has been and always will be, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Prophet Isaiah confirm, affirms Jesus as the king who reigns forever, a role only God could fill. Isaiah 9, verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. There will never end. And then uh, Colossians 1, verse 19. Someone read that for me, Colossians 1, verse 19. So that's almost exactly the same as Colossians 2, verse 9. Two occasions of the fullness of God being mentioned here in Jesus Christ. If Jesus wasn't fully God, he could not have borne the full penalty for sin. That's the bottom line. If Jesus wasn't perfect, if Jesus wasn't fully God, he could not have borne the punishment for sin, taken upon himself the wrath of God. And we ultimately know that Jesus is God because the, on the third day, he, where is he? Showing he had power over what? Death and sin, darkness, evil. He was victorious and had power over over all those things. So Jesus was fully God, is fully God, and fully man. This is the concluding paragraph as we wrap up. Jesus was fully God, Jesus was also fully man. He was fully both at the same time. That's the confusing part. Okay, but I hope it's helped to see how he's calling humanity upon himself. So that's adding to him, not subtracting from him. I think that's a really important takeaway from tonight's study. The eternal Son of God took himself. A truly human nature took upon himself a truly human nature. His divine and human natures are forever distinct and retain their own properties, even though they are eternally and inseparably, inseparably united together in one person. So they're distinct, his two natures, but they're united and they are one. This is probably the most amazing miracle of the entire Bible. The eternal Son of God, himself fully God, became fully man, and in doing so, joined himself to a human nature forever. Jesus, a man, unlike anyone else in the world will ever see again, by eternally bringing together both the infinite and the finite to change the course of history forever. So he brought together infinite and finite by being God and by being human. Some of these thoughts are big thoughts. The more you think about them, the more your head gets wrecked. <laughs> or the more questions you have. But it's a really important thing to understand who Jesus is. Because if we're not sure who Jesus is, we don't fully grasp, we never will fully grasp, but if we don't grasp well enough who Christ is, then he being the very center of everything that we believe, uh, we're going to have problems defending, I don't even like that word, um, we talk about defending our faith, we are going to have problems sharing our faith, making sure that people understand who Jesus is, if we don't really understand who Jesus is ourselves, and how we can be fully God and fully man. So the take home for this evening is the fact that he's bringing upon himself that humanity, not losing anything, any aspect of who he was. Any final questions before we uh, move to prayer? So when we die, yeah. we see him as he is, face yeah. to face. Yeah. But when he returns, if we're still alive, he's coming mm -hmm. back in his glorified body, right? Yeah. So when, will, will he always have his glorified body? I think Jesus has the body that the disciples saw after his, well, many people saw Jesus after his resurrection. That resurrected body, we will recognize him by the memories in his hand the way Thomas did, the way the apostles did. And we'll have a resurrected body, which is the same form as his crucif crucifixion resurrection body is. Right. Right. They're, they are, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Immortal bodies. They go on forever. Very different to the bodies that we have now. Any other questions? Yes, as we were talking, I was thinking about you know, Matthew's statement about the doctor. Mm -hmm. The doctor says, as he rose in the morning, the heavens were open. 
After, after his baptism, and his baptism, and the dove descended upon him. What was that all about? Yeah, the heavens were open to him. The actual phrase uh, when the dove descended upon Jesus at his baptism. Um, well, first of all, it's a mystery, it's not a mystery, but it's you start thinking about why Jesus was baptized. Um, obviously, not for the repentance of sin, like others were at the time of John the Baptist baptizing, but to identify himself with his people. And the dove coming down upon Jesus. What's the reference? Dove descending. Matthew 3 16. That's Jesus. Um, so it's also in Mark and Luke, also in all four Gospels. So um, let's see what this one says. As Jesus was baptized, went up out of water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, with him I love Jesus. But what, what is that all about? I don't think it changes his relationship, it is an expression. In that moment, it wasn't like heaven was closed to him before or after. It was a visual, an encounter where God expressed who his son is and that this is his son. And so there was a, that was a, a moment in time, yeah. not a change in relationship. Yeah, the relationship between the father and son has always been from the time of the past and will always be. And it does not change, has not changed. That confirmation at his baptism that Jesus was the Son of God as the heavens opened and the dove descended down. Those who were there saw something incredible happening, a sign of the fact that this man, Jesus, who in Matthew chapter 3, they really didn't know much about him by this time. If they're, they're just beginning to learn who he is. And eventually, they'll see some incredible signs and wonders, miraculous signs, Jesus raising people from the dead. All of those things will confirm for them who Jesus is. But God is pleased with what Jesus is doing. It marks the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus identifies himself with the believers. And people see that relationship between Jesus and God for the first time, which starts to get them thinking about who this man really is. Yeah. Um, the next part of the week, how it was said in the said that the Holy Spirit was sent on the time of the Lord. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the. The Spirit said what? What, what I think that means is that the, the Spirit of God is the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. So his baptism marked three years of ministry. So that's when it began, his teaching, his miracles, and the rest of it. And the Spirit came upon Jesus to empower him for the task that was set before him. So that's an aspect of, well, that's, what, well, that's exactly what we were talking about earlier on, that Jesus is fully, God is Father, Son, and Spirit, and yet he prays to the Father and he calls upon the Spirit and that trinity is complex. But at that point, the Spirit descends upon Jesus and empowers him for the three years of ministry that he's about to undertake. Is it, is it empowering him or is it that expression of the Holy Spirit working within the people that are there? Uh -huh. um, because you see the Holy Spirit work in the lives of people there yeah. in, a, in a different way than indwelling now that Jesus is not here. I definitely think that's an aspect of it too, but it does specifically say that the Spirit descended upon Jesus mm -hmm. as well. So I think there is a dual purpose in that, yeah, that amazing encounter. Okay, um, Jean, yes. Yeah, I just kind of wanted to add on to what Pastor Bob was saying is that it was my thinking that it demonstrated that kind of triune relationship mm -hmm. more than it was enabling Christ Jesus to be who he was. Mm -hmm. I think the interaction between the, the three doesn't make sense, but if you hold on to some absolute truth, mm -hmm. that kind of guides you through. He was, as you said, the fullness of the deity. Mm -hmm. That we do know. Yeah. And then applying the rest of that knowledge, I think is what's complicated. Yeah. I think it can diminish that idea that he's fully deity. If you're like, it's all complicated. Well, 
how I understand its interaction is complicated, but I, but it's not complicated to know that he is the fullness of Christ, mm -hmm. and that's that I can hold on to. And, and so I don't think he needed this Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to to be who he was. I think it was the expression Absolutely. of that relationship. Yeah, I agree 100 percent because Jesus has never changed in his nature. He's always been fully God. And he took it upon himself to know that. And that brings us full circle back to what we need to take away with this that he didn't <coughs> lose anything, he gained humanity. And that's a really key thing. So keep thinking about these things, just keep talking about these things. This is all really helpful, really useful. Um, I do recommend the book if you want to read more of what I read to you, The Man. Christ Jesus, it's only 140 pages, it's not a big book. Um, it actually caused a lot of controversy. Dr. Wei got himself in a little bit of hot water over some of the stuff in there. And you may not agree with everything he wrote, she's not infallible. Um, but have a read, see what you think. He talks about Jesus calling upon, not setting aside, but calling upon his deity at certain times in his life to do certain things. So calling upon that deity, not actually setting anything aside, but calling upon the deity when he required it to do certain things. But anyway, have a read through. We can talk about that anytime. Let's go to prayer. Um, we have praise points. Praise God for Jesus Christ. That's ultimately what we need to do. We need to praise God for all that Jesus has accomplished for us at Calvary. And praise God that Jesus is alive and that Jesus is coming again. Um, and then our prayer points for this week, as they were on Sunday, our country, our world, our leaders, world issues, um, just the darkness that we exist in, that God would intervene and shine his light in our world so let's go how are you going to s2 yeah okay so there aren't that many of you on that side so if you guys want to go to 